Hi, my name is Elijah, and I have the privilege to serve as the creative pastor here at City Life Church. We just wanted to quickly thank you. Thank you for tuning in wherever you may be watching from. Hey, if you haven't already, please go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. We believe that God has an amazing word for you today. So let's jump into today's message. Amen. I, I'm still a little bit um, on the overflow of worship for a second. So I get a deep breath, okay? Because I know you guys are feeling that when you walked in too. Um, well, I want to welcome you guys this afternoon. We're so blessed to have you today. We got two amazing missionaries, as Pastor just said a minute ago. And I really love to just um, welcome you guys on behalf of our family here. Um, just tell me your name and, and what name of your organization and the ministry that you do. Go ahead. My name is Kyle, and I direct a ministry called Far Flung Tin Can. Yes, you heard that correctly, Far Flung Tin Can. Uh, and we've been around for 14 years now. Awesome. Awesome. I am Celia Mendes. I am originally from Brazil. And I, yeah, Brazilians. <laughs> And uh, I have been living and ministering in Mozambique, Africa for the past 21 years. Now, I'm gonna, I don't want to embarrass you, but can you just say a couple of things in Portuguese? I love the way Portuguese sounds. Anybody, anybody like that? Just say, could you just welcome them? Maybe just something you'll say if you were over there with the students. Just. <laughs> Bom dia, ou bo boa tarde. Uh, Deus está aqui nesta manhã. Okay, all right. Yes. Some of you guys are going, what did she just say? Say it in English, that you just said, so they can hear what the translation. Oh, did you not understand it? No, I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so cool. The Portuguese is the language of heaven. How did okay, you know? Okay, okay. Said, Come on. Good morning. God's Good morning. presence is in here this morning. Well, I want to get out of the way. I want to ask some questions because I, I, I've I already heard a little bit for a service, and I was just, so I got my tissue ready, just to let you know, because um, just, to, just to hear, and um, tell us your story, why, why missions, why you felt called to this, like, I know it's not a ministry for everybody, but everybody can do something, and so if you can just tell me why, I'll start for you, then I'll have a sell you. And I want to say this is it's so, somewhat surreal because I work with Celia. We've been partnered in missions for since 2016. And, but we're always like, we've been in the Amazon together, Japan, Mozambique. We're always like on a dirt road on our way to go find a center. <laughs> so it's very weird. This is the first time we've ever been like ministering together to the but saints. The first time we have been where there are no sinners. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a sinner, please leave now. Uh, now, this is our first time, but, you know, I, I, if I'm not in a jungle, I'm somewhere in the States encouraging people to do missions, and the same with her, but we're never doing it together. We're never tag team. So you better be careful because people aren't used to the two of us provoking you to do missions. So some of you might be, like, on Expedia by the end of service booking a plane ticket, but I was in college. I, had, uh, I was going to go do movies. That was my plan, go to Hollywood, do movies. And uh, I had never been on a missions trip in my life. And I'm running to class, not praying, not feeling super spiritual. I turn my car off, and, it said, and I just see images of me documenting missionaries and telling their stories differently. It was so jarring. I turned the car back on, and I went home, and I wrote down ideas for two weeks. And I knocked on doors. I wanted to just support other organizations and tell stories in this way. And they were all like this is not a good idea. So after six months, I was like, I guess I have to start a missions organization because nobody's going to take a chance on me. I was 22, and I started Far Flung when I was 23. And this is how good God is, is that when I was a kid, I wanted to make movies since I was a little kid. I wanted to make action-adventure movies like Indiana Jones. And I gave that up. I thought well, I was giving that up for something greater than myself. And here, I'm just now realizing, like, maybe a year ago, I was, like, in the jungle, wearing my hat, cutting, literally cutting through the machete. I was like, Lord, you're so good that you gave me actual Indiana Jones adventures, and I'm making movies of it. 
Like, he gave me the real thing. And I thought I was making a sacrifice. And he's like, no, I'm, I know what I'm doing. So I just, Far Flung loves going to these remote places on the planet and telling people about Jesus that nobody wants to go to. Wow. <clears throat> I received Jesus when I was 12 through a dream in which I, I was killed in the dream. And I went, I was taken up to a place called First Heaven. And I said, I want to meet God because I died, but I don't want to be dead. And somebody said, God's not here, go up. So I, I went up to a place called Second Heaven. And then same thing. I said, I want to talk to God because I died. I don't want to be dead. And somebody said, God's not here, go up. So I get to this place called Third Heaven. At this point, I have to tell you this, that I never, ever read the Bible before. I, I didn't even own a Bible. Nobody in my house owned the Bible. And when I got to the place called Third Heaven, I said, I've, I met this being that I, I couldn't make a difference if it was Jesus or God or Holy Spirit and had no uh, uh, reference. And I said, I knew it was God. But I said, I, okay, I died, but I don't want to be dead. And then he said, you are going to be born again. And so that was uh, 13th of October, 1989. And the next day, um, it was Saturday, and then some girls invited me to go to church. It, was, it wasn't a church. It was... Um, uh, the pastor's house, he was planting the Church of God Church in my city in Brazil. And I went to his house, and I was the first person to receive Jesus at that church plant. And today, th they have like about five churches in my city, and then I was the first fruit in that church. But why missions? Because I felt I, I was called even before I was born. It's a purpose. God had the purpose so it, I live a dream, I feel like. I live, I live, I live a dream. But for me, like I mentioned in the other service, the biggest question is not why did I say yes to the Lord? And I say that with my whole heart. For me, I'm so humbled that the Lord would say yes, letting me serve him. Yeah. So far-flung tin can, okay. Everybody's wondering why or how did you come up with that name? Explain. We wanted to come up with a name that you never forget. I think we did that. <laughs> we also wanted a name that, like, if you saw it on a shirt, you would ask, which some days I don't want to talk about far-flung. Like, I'm just want my Chipotle order. And someone's like, excuse me, what is that? Uh, also, like, if you Google Far Flung Tin Can, it's 50 pages of us. Like, it's not like any other missions organization. Like, you're literally, if you Google Far Flung Tin Can, you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, but we wanted to be, create documentaries where you watch the documentary of, of like, Celia Mendez, and you watch it, and after an hour and a half, you're like, I feel like I know her. I feel like... It, she's my friend. I feel like I know her so well. It's like we've been on the phone together. And so I was like, okay, a long distance phone call. So I thought of far flung, which means remote or far away. And then when I was a kid, millennial alert, uh, we had tin can phones that we would make with string. Yeah? Okay, good. All right. So far flung tin can is like the world's longest tin can phone call to the mission field. That's good. So um, I had an opportunity to live through missions through my kids. And um, I've gone on mission trips before, not the ones they have gone on. But one particular, my daughter, Jaylene, she came back totally wrecked from Mozambique. And um, she's not the same girl. Uh, I'm getting emotional, the dad. <laughs> but I, I know what she's told me. And I want them to know a little bit what you do there and why you do that. But... To, just to share what, what you actually do there for the families, the kids, and the community. <clears throat> so when I moved to Mozambique um, in my teenage years, right? <laughs> so I went to work uh, with Heidi Baker's Ministries, um, and I worked at an orphanage where we had 
500 kids. And our kids, they were really blessed because they had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which for, it's not the reality for the majority of the Mozambicans and especially the children. And I started uh, going to um, a different community um, and my heart broke for uh, the reality of that community. And they didn't have anything. Um, they didn't have food every day. They didn't have water, electricity, and you name it. Didn't, uh, there was no construction, no cement building in the whole community. It is, they had what you see probably in magazines, on the internet, those little um, uh, grass houses. And I just thought I wanted to do something. And uh, back then, my monthly support uh, was like $500. And I thought, well, I don't have much. But uh, I mentioned that I said, I'm like, I don't wait for the bus. I will start walking and I'll get the bus on the way. So I'll do whatever I can with whatever little I have or don't have. Because what moves me is not having something on my hand, but it's the vision in my heart. And so I started um, going to that community and my dream was to be able to at least give one glass of milk to the children at least once a week. And um, fast forward, I want to show you what we did today. So we can play a video, you'll see. This is from Thursday. This video is from this week. That is chicken feet. not having any resources and just having a dream, today we feed 300 kids every single day. <laughs> and for a lot of these kids, this is the only meal they have. And sometimes, more often than what we would like, um, some kids, Pastor, I, I know, get your tissue because even I get emotional. Um, they get in and then they seem sick. But over e the years, our teachers already learned that the first thing when the kid come in seeming to be sick, the first thing they do, they take them into the kitchen and then they uh, feed them earlier. And usually it doesn't take even 30 minutes and then they are happy and running around and, and we know that it's because they didn't eat that they ate the day before at the project. And in, in some families, so if they have um, like five or six kids and they have two kids that come to our project, the food, if they have food at the house, then they will serve the other four. And then these two that ate at the project, they will not be able to eat at home because then that food will uh, serve the others. And if we give them a, a packet of of, of cookies, sometimes we do. The mothers tell them, do not open it there. You have to bring to share with your siblings. And so this is a little bit, a little bit of what we do. Yeah, wow. Um, Kyle, I know Far Flowing Tinka is not just the organization, but the organization goes around the world. I would love you to tell people where the places you actually go to um, and what you do in those places. So everywhere we go, it's a little bit of a different strategy. What we do in Mozambique may not work somewhere else. So we'll look at it this year. In two weeks, we'll head to the Arctic, and it'll be sub-zero temperatures. We'll be traveling by ice road to villages that are very remote that nobody goes to. It might be 200 people. We'll go there, put on a worship concert. 
we uh, pour into the youth, um, do a youth conference. Then in, um, in May, we'll come visit Celia, and she'll put on a children's day that the whole nation celebrates, but this village will celebrate it, 2,500 kids, inflatables, face paint. Everybody gets face paint, adults, kids. We'll send a team to go be a part of that, do services. Then in June, we build a church in Thailand in the jungles every year. So we'll go and dedicate a church. We'll go visit three orphanages and uh, work alongside their Bible school. Then we'll go back to Celia and do a youth conference. We do this fun youth conference. We do a glow party. You saw some of the footage. Doing a glow party is already fun for youth, but it's a village that has no electricity. So imagine you've got no electricity, and then there's a, a big rave with black lights and glow sticks. We put on a big youth conference and pour into the, they come busting in from uh, the city. Then uh, a few weeks later, we'll go to Ecuador and do a VBS program, pour into a feeding program. Then in August, we go to the Philippines. We're building uh, churches, putting on roofs in the Philippines. Then in September, we go 500 miles into the Amazon. We found a village and we built a church there and we've been baptized. We baptized 10 in October. And then in October, we'll go to the floating islands of Peru. We built a floating church on a pagan uh, island that is no longer pagan. And we'll go to the highest city on earth and do evangelism to people who are working in really harsh conditions. And then in December, we'll go back and do Christmas in Ecuador. So it's different everywhere we go, but you can also sign up for any of those trips. We have info in the lobby, and you could be joining us. So, yeah, Great work, amen? Some good stuff. Come on. So this is a question for both of y'all. I'm going to start off with Miss Elliot. Um, what is the Lord like? If, if you used to just tell us, what is the Lord doing today? Because we can be so caught up here that we can sometimes miss what God is doing out there. And um, what is the Lord doing today? What is the Lord speaking? <clears throat> I strongly believe the Lord is reviving the ones that are His around the world. I know we have been <clears throat> hearing and watching and studying the statistics of the church dying in Europe and then a lot of Americans like being uh, considered unchurched people. <clears throat> but I strongly believe, I strongly believe, I don't buy into these things that the church the, of Jesus Christ is dying because the word of the Lord says that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. And so the church is advancing. And Jesus never said that the, his church is made of numbers. His church is made of life. And so in, in 2020, we're in, in the bush, like Kyle said, no electricity, nothing. We're, our place is not even uh, found on the map. So if you look for Gumbani on the map, you won't find it. But I just said the church is alive, no matter where, it, where it's at, in the bush, in Europe, America. And in 2020, um, that's what the Lord found us. And we, I want you to see how the church is alive in a place that's not known on the earth, but it's known and heard in heaven. is doing on the earth <laughs> reviving the ones that are his
the hardest thing to watch is because they're praying for us. I never heard this before, but I'll just say this, that as much as we're sending missionaries out there to the world, God's bringing missionaries out the world back to the States because there's a generation that's dying that needs to know the truth and feel the life of God and, and to see kids praying for us. I'm sorry, guys. Forgive me. Taking a deep breath, sorry. I would love um, if you could share one particular story, Kyle, one trip that you took um, that I don't think people can fathom. You said especially the, the pagan, like what, what God has done through that. Um, this is a story. Um, I tell this one a lot because it personally changed my life more than other. I, I was just calculating the other night. With, with Mary, and I said, how many, how many trips do you think I've been on with Far Flung in the last 14 years? This, in the Arctic, me personally, would be my 53rd trip in the last 14 years. And this one trip, normally we find someone on the ground like Celia who's doing incredible work, and we, and we come alongside, like, how can we shine light on what they're doing? And in 2019, the Lord showed me the highest city on earth through a documentary I was watching. And I mentioned it at the far-flung retreat, just kind of like, these are the places I'm looking at. And I looked over at Gary. Gary is this guy that travels with us, big guy, looks like Wreck-It Ralph. I'm Fix-It Felix. And uh, I looked over at him as I talked about the highest city on earth in Peru. And I looked at that with that wild eye, and I went, oh, no, we're going. And five weeks later, we're going. There's no one on the ground there. It's a gold mining town. 60,000 gold miners. It blew up so quickly. There's no running water. It's it wrought with arsenic and mercury poisoning and sex trade. And there's no laws and no police. And they'll burn you alive if you steal. And everybody's robbing each other. It's like the Wild West, but it's so high in elevation, there's no oxygen. And we didn't find out a lot of this until we bought the tickets. <laughs> And on our way there, I'm like asking, I'm talking to all these Peruvians and like, where are you heading? I said, I'm going to La Rinconada. And they were like, and like in the Wild West, like everybody stops and like the, the doors, start, and they're like, you cannot go there. And I was like, okay. And, I, and so instead of praying, I asked someone else like, hey, tell me about La Rinconada. And they're like, no good news comes from a La Rinconada. And I was like... Okay, and I just keep asking people, and, and essentially the verdict is, if you go there, you will die. So we're in a taxi now. We've been traveling for days to get to the city, and I'm literally, there's four of us traveling with plus our guide and the taxi driver. So I'm on top of the luggage in the back of the taxi. Like, people probably thought I was kidnapped when they looked at the back, because I'm literally there. And I'm starting, and I'm not telling anybody I'm afraid, but I'm freaking out. And I'm like, I'm going to die. And so I put in my headphones, and I'm like, all right, we need to have a meeting, me and Jesus. And I, I was like, all right, God, like, I have a wife and daughter back home. First of all, do I really think you called me to this place? Or is it that, like, my ego, like, oh, far flung goes to the highest city on earth. And so I, I really, like, replayed everything and how I got there. And I was like, no, I really believe God called me. Okay. So second, does that mean I come home? So I started thinking, okay, let's look at my heroes. Jesus. Okay, John the Baptist. Every, every disciple. Okay, so you're telling me I could be in God's will and this might be a one-way ticket. Okay, now, am I still going to go? And I was like, Yes, but what am I going to do with it? If there's a, a decent chance that I'm not coming home, what am I going to do with the time I'm up there? And by the way, we had no strategy. We had no contacts. We literally were just going to go in the middle of the square and start preaching in a town full of heathens with no oxygen. <laughs> so we get up there, and we start pre preaching, and we give a salvation message, and nobody comes down. And we wait and wait. Finally, one gold miner takes his helmet off and he comes and kneels. 
and then a bunch come kneel. And so we start praying, and we form a line, and we start praying for people, and we pray for healings and salvations and everything. And like an hour goes by, and the line just keeps staying. And we keep praying and praying, and uh, people start coming up saying, hey, how much are you charging for healings? And I was like, N- uh, nothing? That's a weird question. And so then like a blizzard happens, and a blizzard's hitting, and all this time's going by, and we don't even realize it. So finally, after four hours of just standing in the square praying, someone asked me again, how much are you charging for healing? So there's a lot of witchcraft up there and things. I said, why are you asking me that? And they said, a few hours ago, my cousin was healed, and he ran up the mountain and said, you have to get to the square. These four men have come, and they're healing people. And for nine hours straight, hundreds, over 800 came. And we have gone back every single year. Now we go back. We, we, there are gold miners that have been saved and transformed. And now they go and travel with us. And they evangelize with us. We have seen so many things that they know who we are. People, they get so excited. When we show up, they're like, you're back. They know we want nothing from them. Because previously, the only... Americans that come, they want their gold. And we told them straight up, we do not want your gold. And actually, we have something far greater than you than gold and silver. And it was the easiest ministry opportunity of my life. And, I, and when I came down, I did not come back the same person. Because I'm not afraid to give up my life. I'm not afraid. The only thing that I'm afraid of is that I will waste it. And that's what I think of now when I'm on ministry. I do not want to waste the time that I have. So I've heard the statement, the needs, the call. And when I was doing kids ministry, that's what I felt the Lord told me to do is to minister to kids because there wasn't a lot of people doing it. And as I put my hand to the plow, God started providing and showing me and equipping us. So you go into Mozambique, you had no Bible training, you just had the call. And I know you mentioned the feeding, but there's more you do there. What has the Lord been doing with that? So we train those, those kids in the word of the Lord. So the kids that you saw here praying, they go through a program where we, uh, we don't just feed them, as you saw. We, just, we don't just feed them physical food, but we teach them the word of God. There's a very, very solid program that goes from teaching how to read all the way to a Bible character and morals and biblical principles. And so when COVID hit, this was during COVID, before the government closed down the schools and churches. So this was right before. Then soon after, the government closed the churches and, and the schools and so on. And when the government opened up the churches, they said no kids and no teenagers. And then that went on for two years until almost the end of 2021. When when the government closed the churches, we had in our church about 35 youth. When the government opened the churches, then we had 130. These kids had grown up to be then the youth, and the youth then had grown up to be the young adults, and so w- what do we do? We teach the word of the Lord to children, youth, young adults, adults. We have a, a vibrant church. We have about 400 people in our church, including those kids, because the kids, I count them more than the adults. <laughs> the adults is there today and then not tomorrow, but the kids, they're there today today and two years later, even when the churches are closed. Come on. That's so good. Come on. I'll ask you one more question, Kyle. This is, um, I know besides the missions, um, you also educate kids. So I know we're talking about adults, but there's a lot of kids and youth involvement too. So tell me what you do and how you do that. We realize we want everybody to be passionate about missions. And we want kids to be passionate about missions before they can go on missions, right? It makes sense. Like, why would you wait until they can travel to tell them that it's important? So we started telling kids about 
sharing and helping others and the Great Commission. And we started writing kids' books. And then we started a puppet kids' show where we're like, looking ridiculous. I have been crawling around the dirt and the frozen tundra. PJ here has been, he got frost nip filming with puppets in the Arctic with me. Uh, but we've been filming this kids' show. So kids are so excited about meeting someone like David the polar bear or Celia the lioness. And they love her story and their coloring books. And, and then they grow, and we provided these books in Gumbani village as well. Many of these kids, it's their first book. It's about their village. So they're proud of their own village, but we want kids to be passionate about meeting Celia the lioness so that when they grow up, they can actually go on a trip. They realize that Celia the lioness is not some tale, but she's a real life hero. And they get to go and be passionate about missions way before they can travel. And, and I told that in the first service, and I think we sold out on, yeah, we, y'all, I cannot believe, I don't think we've ever sold out on books, ever. I usually bring more than enough. You can, you can order them on our website, and we will ship them this week, but the first service just went nuts and bought all of our kids' books, but there's other stuff out there. But we want the next generation to grow up already knowing the importance of missions. There is still some T-shirts There's and some magazines. There's plenty of stuff out yeah. there that you're going to All the books are gone. <laughs> so still come to the table. Just not getting a kid's book. And after service, he'll be there. If you have any more questions, he'll definitely. Um, Sally, if you don't mind, I would love you to, to um, just share a small encouragement, and then I would love you to pray for us. And um, wherever the Lord leads you. <clears throat> well, you said a small um, you better turn off. Okay, here we already passed the time, so the, the time expired, so you forget about your watches. Um, because Pastor Jason, a few weeks ago, the Lord has given me a word for, for City Life and this campus uh, specifically. And I know that Pastor Tony is not here, but I hope that he can watch this. And I know Pastor Casey is here somewhere. Because this is a word that the Lord gave me. And then it's burning my heart, and this word is waking me up at night. Mm. I didn't preach it anywhere and probably won't because this is um, a custom-made word. It's from the Lord. And when Kyle shared about the Latin Conada... Gosh, I, I almost jumped out of the seat. Of course, I know this story. But because it fits perfectly into what the Lord gave me. But I want to read um, Exodus 34, 1 to 5. It says, the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. And I will write them. And I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. No one, no one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain, not even the flocks and herds. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up the Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord told me, gave me an audible, in an audible voice, shouted to my ears to shout here at City Light, the summit is yours. The Lord shouted that, uh, Casey, and I want you to hear this carefully. And Tony, the summit is yours. Because that was a very direct word that the Lord gave me to give to you and to the church. And I told, I said, it's been f a few weeks. And if you don't mind me standing, because the fire of the Lord in me can, does not let me sit. <laughs> and I have been asking and praying, Lord, but what is the summit? Because on earth, 
the summit is a position. On earth, the summit is, is a title. The summit is success. The summit is money. This is on earth. But Carl and I know a, a famous singer, American singer, I won't, I won't say the name. We know this person pers personally. And he won a Grammy. And then he told us that when he got the prize, when he got the Grammy, he was like, what's next? He reached the top. He reached the summit. But he felt empty. He said, I never felt so empty in my life. You work so much towards something, and when you get it, then what's next? You were at the top. Because the summit on earth for some people is the end, but the summit in God is just the beginning. The invitation for the summit is for everyone. The, listen, the invitation to come up the mountain is for everyone, but it is not for a crowd. That's good. When God invites someone to the summit, not everyone goes because not everyone is willing to die. Do you understand how this word is for today, for this hour, for this morning, for Casey, for Tony, for City Life? Do you understand that? Can you hear that? Can you discern that? Because Latin Conada happened a few years ago. And in the first service, Kyle didn't mention all of the details that he mentioned. And I know them. But the Lord just reminded me why. Because God had given me a few points in this. The way to the summit can be lonely. It's written here. And Cal described it. The way to the summit. And mind you, this is the highest, the highest city in the world. On the, the uh, living Far from everything. They wait, but to go up the summit, you need to be ready. If you go back later and then you um, read back, the Lord says to Moses, get ready. You don't go just any way. You, don't, you just don't decide, I'm going to gonna go up the summit and then just decide to start working. I'll tell you something. The, the best times of my days... And the worst times of my days are when I'm trying to work out. It's so hard. And I started working out because I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa. I want to go with Paflang. So I started working out. And every day, God is speaking to me, and I do not want to go work out. I do not want to go on the treadmill. I do not want to go on the elliptical. But then the Lord says, the way up the summit requires sacrifice. The way up the summit you requires discipline. The way up the summit requires obedience. And you have to go alone. Moses was married and had kids, but he didn't take his wife along. He didn't take his kids along. Be this is why it can be lonely. See, the wind chill, it burns you. It freezes you. On the outside, you may be freezing. On the inside, you may, you may even feel dead. Because you feel abandoned sometimes. You feel like you are on something to die. The way up the summit is not easy. It is dif difficult. But what is the summit? What is it? I said it's not for the world. The summit can be a title, can be a position, can be uh, fame, can be a name, can be uh, money. But in the Lord, in the kingdom of God, the summit is this place in the heart of God that when you reach it, you won't be ever, ever, ever be the same. And Kyle said it, gosh, I, I don't know, I am so, 
so thrilled because he showed everything that Lord had given me in a practical way. Because his life was changed and transformed. Why? Because on the way up the summit, you really encounter, before you encounter God, you encounter yourself. You find out who you really are. You find out who you were really made of. Am I made for this? Am I willing to die for what I'm saying that I, I'm living for? Am I willing to die for the Lord? This is the summit. The way up the summit. So I know we, we passed the time, so I just want to wrap up before we pray, and I'll tell you, the, tell, tell you this. When Moses reached the summit... He was changed from the inside out. He shone bright. When we encounter the summit, we are changed, but the result is broad. Because Moses got the tablets and then the Ten Commandments. And so what he got at the summit was not just for himself. It was for generations. So everyone is invited to the summit, but not everyone gets to the summit because not everyone wants, are willing to die. Not everyone is willing to sacrifice. Not everyone is willing to obey. But I tell you, City Light, Pastor Tony, Pastor Casey, you have been called by the Lord to come up the summit. Are you willing? Pastor Jason, are you willing? To come up the summit? Are you willing to sacrifice, to obey? Are you willing to die? Because when you go, see, I told you, I do not want to get up in the morning at 5, 5.30 and then go on a treadmill. I do not want to do it. But this message, it's not my shape. It's not my health that's calling me because I have been needing to get in shape my whole life. But this message right here is bringing me out of bed because I'm like, the summit needs, requires sacrifice. Because there, I'll tell you, every single line that the Lord has given me was at that place of summit, was being with him at that place. And I'll tell you this, if you respond to God's call this morning, and you say, Lord, I want to go up La Rinconada. I want to go up the summit. I want to warn you in advance. There will be times that you will feel your legs shaking. There will be times you will feel your muscles denying from, from keeping going forward. There will be times you will, you will pant. You, you're breathing. You will feel like you're going to die. You feel like quitting. And then just two days ago, I was there on a, on a treadmill. And then I decided to run. And I was like, okay, I will run for 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh gosh, the two minutes to 20 minutes never come. And I thought, oh, maybe I will stop. And then I said, no, I want to reach the summit. And so... Even if you get two minutes to the summit, even if you get two minutes, do not give up. Keep on going. Keep on going. Do not give up. Because if Moses had given up before he reached that place in God, we would not even probably be here. We would not have had the, the, the Ten Commandments. He would not have met God face to face. Do not give up. Casey, Tony, Pastor Jason, Thais, do not give up. Even if the hardships come. So see, I, I say that uh, we, we, far flung, we post on social media and we only post the good stuff. You have no idea. You have no idea what, what goes on behind the, 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 the social media. I have been put in prison once because I was involved in an accident and a, boy, a 12 years old boy died. And then I was... Uh, uh, in a, a court case because of that. And then in, when they opened up the cell, they said, go in with 40 men. And I looked at myself and I thought, oh, I felt like a lamb going into, into the wolf's cave. But I tell you what, for three years, Pastor Jason, I said, no one will ever convince me that this was for a reason. 
No one will ever tell me, you know, we are pastors, missionaries, and we are church people and Christians, and we learn how to say the, good, the right stuff. And no, we cannot say that God abandoned me. But I felt abandoned. I was like, I was doing ama amazing outreach. Many people were reached. Now why? But I didn't let the thoughts come up to my head because I didn't want to sin against the Lord. But what I did, I turned my back. I was so offended. And then for three years, I said, no one will ever convince me that this is for a reason. This is for a reason. And I tell you, fast forward, this happened like 13 years ago. But I will tell you this. My life was never the same because I died and was born again through that hardship. The way up the summit is hard. But if you can make it to the top, you will see the great things because any mountain from the bottom looks really big. Any mountain from the bottom looks really high. But when you are at the top, nothing is big enough. When you look down from Latin Conada, everything, even the human, even the lions that can kill you at the bottom, you see them like this big. So the invitation for you today is, will you come up the summit? If you are, then you stand right now and I will pray. And I will pray, stand up. If you want to die... This is a call to die. This is a call for sacrifice. This is a call for not giving up. This is a call for you to step up and meet God face to face and experience his glory like you have never before. If you want to have what you never had, you will have to do what you never did. I do not know what that is for you. I know what it is for me. What is it that you really want? What is it that you never did? God is inviting you this morning to come up the summit. But I will tell you, it will not come without sacrifice, death to yourself. But your life will never, ever be the same again. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, right now, I come before you. I come before you and I, as I have delivered your word to City Life, to Pastor Tony, Pastor Casey, I bring myself before you and I intercede for this church and for your servants here. Father, in the name of Jesus, that we this morning may respond to your call to go up the summit. Father, even if we died on this earth, but as long as we meet you face to face. Father, the way up the summit is not easy. It is painful many times. It is lonely. We feel abandoned. We feel rejected. We feel betrayed. But Father, help your people to keep going and not give up. Help your people to keep pushing through, even if they go through jail in a, in a cave with wolves, but they will keep pushing through. Because Moses could only reach the summit because he pushed through 40 days of fasting, no drinking, no eating. Father, I pray right now for City Life. I pray right now for Pastor Tony, Pastor Casey. I pray right now for your servants in this place. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that your people may respond to your call in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Before we close, I'm going to, because I know this is, hurt, this is feeling a lot of hearts. And um, thank you for being obedient. Anybody know that that's for you today? Yeah. Amen. Um, I just feel like we need to pray for those who never gave their life to Christ. And if you want to help me pray for that, Kyle, is that cool? And then... Um, I just feel like there's hearts that are just pulsating right now. Like, I feel the call, but I got to give my life to Christ. And uh, you, could, you could do that. If you're in the room and, and you just feel something on your heart, you feel that maybe Jesus is tugging at me. Maybe he is, that stirring is God speaking through his Holy Spirit, pulling you in. 
and you feel like you're on the outside of what's happening here, but the Lord's saying, you've got an invitation to be a part of this too. Not just an invitation, I knew you would be here this morning. So if you just pray with me, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. I thank you for the opportunity of my life that you would bring me here today. I accept that you have created this world and you put me in it with purpose. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you start my life over right now? But a life with you, a life greater than myself, a life with peace and joy and hope, Lord, I'm walking in your steps from here on out. Guide me in the way that you want me to. Thank you for your sacrifice. And I promise to tell others of what you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, amen. Come on, give Jesus the highest praise that he deserves it. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And so you being a part of that means so much to us. Our vision here at City Life is to reach the lost, help restore what has been broken, and to release people into their God-given purpose. If you would like to partner with us today, text GIVE to 844-311-1777 or visit our website. For more great content and messages, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also download our City Life app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram while you're at it. Our services are at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd love to have you be with us in person at one of our locations. And like we say here at City Life, go and be the city.